When I worked in a movie theater in my late teens and early 20s, I lived a lot of my life after midnight, especially when I became a manager and head projectionist at 19. I was responsible for scheduling showtimes, building up and doing tech runs of the film prints, and general day-to-day -day management of employees. That's quite a bit of responsibility thrown onto a person whose brain isn't fully developed. <laughs> Let's just say that impulse control wasn't always top priority for me. And with the place being owned by a billionaire who thought the best way to bring business to a struggling independent theater was to add love sacks, couches, and blankets to the main house, <laughs> impulse control wasn't a priority from top to bottom. <laughs> For those not in the know, love sacks are oversized memory foam beanbag chairs and sectionals that are perfect for discreetly fucking in the back of a movie theater. <laughs> in fact, there was a certain back corner of theater one, barely illuminated by the hue of a scarlet light, which we all loving, lovingly refer to as the red light district. <laughs> the amount of people that I caught dancing the horizontal mambo in that back corner was incalculable. The Love Sack Theater was doomed for sexual depravity from the start. When the renovations on the downstairs theater were finally completed, it was clear that corporate had no idea what kind of monster they had on their hands. The first film they decided to open the Love Sack Theater with was an independent drama called The Babysitters, starring John Leguizamo, Katherine Watterson, and Cynthia Nixon. The plot revolves around a 16-year-old girl who starts an escort service after sleeping with one of her babysitting clients. It was tawdry, it was gross, it was literally the worst fucking movie for the grand reopening of our main house. We only sold about three to four tickets per show. Every customer that bought a ticket that opening Friday was a single white middle-aged male. <laughs> After purchasing their ticket, they would shamefully approach the concession stand. Uh, can I just grab some napkins? Sure. <laughs> They then proceeded to grab a handful of napkins before slinking into the theater without purchasing anything from the concession stand. I'll let you fill in the rest. I immediately complained to corporate about these interactions and explained that they were setting a dangerous precedent. They agreed immediately and swapped the movie out with the romantic comedy, What Happens in Vegas? <laughs> Little did I know that that would set the precedent of romantic comedy comedies dominating the Love Sack Theater. I had to hand it to the billionaire uh, that wanted to put those love sacks in, though. I may have despised those damn seats, but after corporate realized that we needed to start playing mainstream films in the love sack theater, we were no longer struggling. The theater was originally built in the 1940s in Dallas, Texas, as a one-house theater that could seat over 2,000 people. It smelled of buttered popcorn, decades of old cigarettes, and past oppression. The balcony level used to be segregated for colored people only before it was converted into two smaller theaters with stadium seating, while the main house downstairs is where our forever unclean love sacks lived. Since the theater was so old, it was considered a Texas landmark, and as such, didn't need to be renovated in order to adhere to any fire codes or Americans with Disability Act regulations. We worked in a death trap. In fact, people have died in the theater, and I believe I have personally interacted with one of those ghosts. One particular night, I experienced something that I still question to this very day. The last shows of the night were about to start, and as a manager and projectionist, I had a habit of waiting until tickets uh, to the last showing were purchased before threading the film through the projector. It made my job faster at the end of the night, since I didn't have to wait for the movie to be over before heading home. No one had bought tickets for what was playing in theater two, and at this point, no one would. So I headed through the empty theater up to the projection booth to break down the projector for the night. As I shut everything down, I looked through the porthole to see an old man sitting in the theater. I thought it was odd because I had just walked through the theater seconds earlier, and he wasn't there, but thought maybe he'd just been walking behind me and I hadn't noticed. I radioed to the box office. Hey guys, do we sell any tickets to theater two? Nope. Well, I got a guy in here, maybe he's in the wrong theater. I walked down the steps from the projection booth into the theater, and within the 30 seconds it took me to travel down the stairs, he disappeared. I was confused. I walked over to the adjacent theater to see if maybe he'd realized his mistake. In the theater was a young couple, the only two tickets that were sold for that showing. I walked downstairs to the concession stand. Um, hey, weird question. Did you happen to see an old man come downstairs? The concessionist stared at me. No. 
know. Why? It's nothing. And I left it at that. The next day, I came in and started chatting with the general manager, JT, a 30-something hipster who was always cool as a cucumber. I told him the exact story I just told you, and his response, oh, that was the old guy that died here in the 90s. One of the previous managers here had the same thing happen. He called the cops thinking someone was hiding in the building. After the cops searched the property, they cited him for filing a false police report, and he got fired. Well, thank God I didn't call the cops. Being a stupid fucking kid with quite a lot of power, I, I wielded it as graciously as I possibly could. I was the same age as all of my employees, and the last thing I wanted was for them to see me as a power-hungry prick that did not consider them my peers. So I always let people hang out after the night was over and all the customers had left. We would watch movies together late at night on the big screen as we smoked weed, drank till we couldn't see straight, and smoked cigarettes until our lungs screamed for reprieve. All of this took place inside the theater, mind you. There's that issue with impulse control again. I was always worried that after one of our nights of heavy drinking and smoking, I would come in the next day and our previous night of debauchery would be discovered. But it seemed that decades of old cigarette smoke and general disarray of the couches and love sacks somehow covered our tracks. Either that or the fact that I was the only trained projectionist and third in command kept me just above water. To say this, is, this was one of my favorite jobs is an understatement. As a cinephile, not only was I in heaven, I was a god in this heaven. <laughs> One special Thursday night, I had the pleasure of performing a tech run of Pineapple Express before its Friday opening. <laughs> I let every employee know that they could bring whoever they wanted, as long as that person brought some of that sweet, sticky icky. <laughs> Keep in mind, this was a small theater with 12 employees in total. We were all excited for this movie. I mean, shit, this was at the height of the R-rated comedies of the mid-aughts, and Seth Rogen had been producing banger after banger. The 40-year-old virgin, knocked up, super bad, and now the culmination of his skills was bringing us one of the greatest stoner comedies of all time. It's 11.59 on Thursday night. The general manager, JT, popped into the projection booth to tell me he's headed home. I gave him a nod and followed him outside to smoke a cigarette before I texted my employees that I'm starting the movie in the next five minutes. I lit my cigarette and took a quick drag. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I glanced around the normally barren parking lot. Strangely, I saw hundreds of cars. <laughs> I got a sense of unease as I took a long drag from my cigarette. I sent out the text, and almost simultaneously, all the doors on all the cars in the parking lot popped open. <laughs> Over 200 people had shown up to watch this screening. My cigarette barely hung on to my agape mouth as I watched person after person file past me with a myriad of finger guns, thumbs ups, and high fives. If anyone from the FBI is listening to this, these were all family members and this was a family reunion. I'm not trying to catch a felony charge for unlawful exhibition of a copyrighted film here tonight. I walked into the theater to see a deluge of people swirling about. I decided it was time for a little speech before the show. I stood up on the stage in front of the screen and the dull roar of the crowd quieted. I played it cool. How's everybody doing tonight? Thunderous cheers and applause broke out. That's what I like to hear. Well, if you were invited tonight, then you already know that there was a stipulation for your attendance. More hooping and hollering from the crowd as they all began to produce various forms of paraphernalia from backpacks, fanny packs, and purses. Good, I'm glad we're all in agreement. Without further ado, Let's get this fucking show on the road. I hopped down from the stage and jogged back to the projection booth. As I did, the crowd lit up and smoke began pouring into the theater. As the movie started, I ran to my seat and as it played, blunts, bongs, bubblers, pipes, and joints were being passed around left and right. Say what you will about us stoners, but we sure are a communal bunch. <laughs> It was a glorious way to watch the movie, and I honestly think Seth Rogen would have given his stoner stamp of approval. As the final credits rolled and the last of my employees' friends trickled out of the theater, I turned on the house lights to assess the damage. Holy fucking shit. We had hotboxed the entire theater. Anyone standing in this room would get an instant contact high. Since we didn't have to adhere to fire codes, we didn't have sprinkler systems or smoke detectors. So my stomach was flipping like an Olympic gymnast. It was two in the morning, 
and the assistant general manager, Nixon, a notorious square, was coming to open for the first show in less than six hours. I was beyond fucked. I ran to all the emergency exit doors and busted them all open. I grabbed one of the crusty love sack blankets in the theater and started furiously trying to fan the smoke out. A couple of employees joined me. After about 10 minutes of us flapping about, it was clear that no progress was being made. I thought, well, this is it. You're gonna get fired for sure. I'm coming in the next, uh, the next day to work the four o'clock shift. I'll face the consequences tomorrow. All I can do now is sleep. The next day I arrived at work wholly expecting to get shit canned. As I walked through the front doors, I got a whiff of freshly popped popcorn, cigarettes, and the devil's lettuce. <laughs> I glanced at the concession stand. The employees looked at me with half smiles and wide eyes, which read to me as, good luck, bud. <laughs> I walked into the manager's office to clock in, and there was Nixon. His face was twisted with anger. I am so mad right now. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah, you won't believe what happened this morning. I went to start the first showing of Pineapple Express and I caught a guy in the red light district smoking weed. It smells like a skunk's butthole in the theater. I kicked that guy out immediately. <laughs> oh wow, I exclaimed. That's why it smells like weed. <laughs> You may think I learned something from this experience, but my punishment continues to elude me, and I gain no deeper knowledge of myself. This confession has meant nothing. I often think about that theater. Like an old lover, she haunts me. Sometimes I dream about her. I dream that I'm 20 years old and stupid again climbing the rickety ladder all the way to the tip of her neon sign with a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other, looking over the barren wasteland of suburbia that surrounds here, or surrounds her. Here, in my little death trap, I didn't have to think of the future, nor did I want to. Sometimes, I envy those ghosts that wander her halls. My only hope is that she remembers me, and when my time comes, she embraces me like Rose returning to the Titanic. <laughs> and I may return to my little heaven, my theater in the clouds. Woo! Travis Lowe, everybody, vamp first timer.